In our efforts to open minds and shape decisions and offer solutions, we think it's really important for all of us, all of us working with data, communicating data, visualizing data, to be more equitably and more inclusive in how we do that. And last June, Alice and I published this report from the Urban Institute called the Do No Harm Guide, where we uh, described a number of possible solutions to those of us trying to be more equitable in our day-to-day -day work around data and data visualization. And what we're not going to do is give you a set of rules or a set of specific guidelines. We're really going to ask you to think about these issues as you're working with your data. And so what I'm going to do is going to provide you with a few what we think are very practical uh, steps that you can take when you're working with your data. And then Alice is going to talk about a specific project that she worked on where she wrapped all of this work together into a single project at the Urban Institute. So this work really came out of uh, the racial justice protests uh, a couple of years ago after the uh, uh, murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and far too many others. Um, Alice and I, as people working in the field of data visualization, working with data, communicating data, really thought about how we could contribute to this conversation. And we felt that there was a real gap in how people were approaching the idea of being equitable and being inclusive and taking that racial awareness to how they were communicating data. And so we interviewed more than 20 different people across a variety of fields, including public health, including justice policy, including data journalism, to see how we might think about being more equitable and inclusive in our work. So before I go into some of those practical uh, concepts some practical ideas that you can use every day in your work, it's important, I think, to do a little level setting. Because as a uh, white male uh, living here in the United States, my lived experience is going to be very different uh, than people in other countries. It's going to be very different from people here across the United States. Um, for example, I'm a Jewish American, uh, but my experience dealing with anti-Semitism is going to be very different than, say, a Black or African American person who might be afraid of being pulled over by the police or might not uh, feel comfortable walking through their neighborhood at night with a, with a hooded sweatshirt. Um, that being said, as someone who spends a lot, has spent a lot of time working in public policy, has spent a lot of time thinking about how we work with data and communicate data and visualize data, um, and as you know, just a member of society and as a dad to two kids, I think it's really important for us to be having these conversations because as we all know, data and data visualization has become so much more important in how we process and see information, uh, how we uh, get information out into the world, and so if we can take the lead as the data visualization community, if we can take the lead in being more equitable and being more inclusive and in forcing some of these higher conversations, we can improve the world around us. Now, as I mentioned, we interviewed more than 20 different people uh, for this report. And the through line, the thread that really came out of this work is this concept of demonstrating empathy for the people that we're focusing on and the people and communities that we're trying to communicate with. And one of the people we interviewed is a data journalist by the name of Kim Bui. And Kim, I think, really summarized this in, in just, just a great way. Kim said, if I were one of the data points on this visualization, would I feel offended? And so I think if we, as people working with data, visualizing data, if we can put ourselves in the shoes of the people that we are uh, uh, showing in our visualizations, can we consider whether we would be offended if we were presented in that way? The ways that we use words, colors, icons, uh, labels, all the things that we include in and around our visualizations. If we can be more empathetic to those people and communities that we're representing in our visuals, we can be more equitable and more inclusive. So let me talk about a few practical things that we think you can use in your work starting today. And the first thing you might want to think about is using language with an equitable approach. And one thing that we sort of, many of us think about is using people first language. We might want to say people with disabilities rather than disabled people. And of course, using people first language is not uh, specific to, or is not generalizable to every group. Some uh, groups, some communities do uh, use, uh, don't use people first language, but uh, what, we'll, what we also talk about in this report is, is communicating with the people that you are focusing on. Um, but in general, we might want to use people first language. But the challenge with language is that it's, it's not straightforward and it's always nuanced and it's always evolving. And so words and terms and phrases that we use today may not be words that we use tomorrow. But we want to show you just one example 
from a Tableau dashboard uh, that we think can be illustrative of this point. So what you see in front of you is the top third of a Tableau dashboard. Um, there are three bivariate choropleth maps in this dashboard. The first one here for Black or African-American people in the United States. There's another map for Hispanic or Latino people. And there's another map for white people in the United States. Now, I know this is a data visualization conference, but let me quickly explain what a bivariate choropleth map is for those of you who don't know. So a choropleth map, if you're attending this conference, you probably know what a choropleth map is. Um, this is a choropleth map. This is a simple one showing the unemployment rate in the United States. Uh, across all the states. What we have is a single color ramp here going from a light blue to a dark blue. So states with the lowest unemployment rates are in the light blue and states in the dark, states with the highest unemployment rates in the dark blue. A bivariate choropleth map uh, works in the same way, but instead of having one variable, we have two variables. So this is a bivariate choropleth map. And I'm gonna zoom in on the legend so that you can see what's being plotted here. So on one dimension of this bivariate choropleth map is the poverty rate. And so we have uh, states that are counties in this case that uh, from a low poverty rate to a high poverty rate. And then we have counties uh, on the density of a uh, number of people who identify as black or African-American along the horizontal axis. So you can see in those areas that have a lower density of black residents and a lower poverty rate or in that sort of yellowish peachish color, that's kind of in the, in the middle part of the country. And the counties that have a higher poverty rate and a higher density of Black or African uh, American residents uh, is in that very, very dark purple, almost black color. And that's in the southeastern part of the United States. Okay, so now you know how that, that map works. Let's talk about the language that's being used here. Well, on the vertical axis, we have this phrase, more poverty. Well, poverty is an experience. It's not a static description of a person or a household. My household income could be below the poverty line this year, but not necessarily next year. More importantly, for the purposes of at least our work, is the phrase more black on the horizontal axis. Now, the phrase more black references skin color, doesn't reference people. And again, think about how someone might see themselves being referenced as more black. If, for example, if this from, from, from my lived experience, if this said more Jewish, but that's not something that I would uh, particularly like. I would feel offended by that phrasing. And so how would Black or African-American people feel about the phrase more Black? And so we think there are some better ways to go about using labels and, and, uh, and describing people and communities. So for example, in this particular legend, in this particular example, you might, might want to use something like larger proportion of the black population on the horizontal axis and larger proportion of people in poverty on the vertical axis. Yes, they're longer. Yes, they're more verbose. No, they don't work as nicely along the legend here or along a bar chart. But again, how, would, how do people feel when they see themselves being represented in the data? We want to take that, that approach of being empathetic to the people and communities that we're communicating with. Um, now, it is worth noting that the original author who created this visualization was very willing to have these conversations with us and ultimately changed that uh, label along that horizontal axis to the larger, to larger Black population, which is certainly better, I would argue, certainly better than, than more Black. And so uh, we can all improve, we can all evolve, and we need to be willing to have these conversations because that's how we can move forward. Okay, so talked about color, let's talk about missing groups. And uh, there's a little bit of a nuance here, a little bit of a subtle, subtlety. What, we, what we're talking about in this section of the work is not missing data the way you might tend to think of it. You know, Maybe a bunch of people don't answer the question about income or about race or about gender or about whatever in the survey. They just have some missing observations. Here we're talking about people that are actually, there are no options for them. They are not represented in the data itself and the survey itself. And I think the easiest way to think about that is on gender. We know that gender is not binary, but basically ever, every major federal uh, government survey presents gender as a binary option, male or female. And there are lots of examples of bad ways to ask this question. I think my, the one in the top right is one of my uh, least favorite here, where the options are male, female, and human. Um, but there are, there, uh, there are better ways to uh, ask these questions uh, and trying to be more inclusive in the survey data. Let's go back to race for a moment. Uh, what do you see here are the six major categories of race 
in the American Community Survey, which is collected by the US Census Bureau, same categories used in the decennial census. And so what we have is a lot of aggregate groups. We have American Indian and Alaskan Native, we have Asian and Pacific Islander on the bottom there. So these are the six major categories. Now, we can calculate the poverty rate for each of these specific or these aggregate uh, categories, but we could also dive in and see what the specific subcategories are within each of these larger six. And so the black transparent dots here show you the overall poverty rate. You can see for the American Indian or Alaska native population, the poverty rate in this year we estimate is 23.1% down to 9.7% for the Asian or Pacific Islander group. But when you look more deeply at the data, you look at the subcategories, the more detailed categories, you see a huge variation in these estimated poverty rates. Let's take a look at Asian and Pacific Islanders at the bottom of this graphic. You can see that the uh, estimated poverty rates span from about 5% over on the far left to almost 30% on the far right. And so there's huge variation going on within these aggregate groups. And it's how we ask these questions and how we represent these groups and talk about these groups in our work is what we are asking you to think about. There are obviously sample size considerations to take into account here. Some of these dots, some of these groups represented by dots in this graph have you know, 100 or 200 people uh, answered uh, the, the race question in that particular way. Others have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of observations uh, people answered in that way. So there are statistical and mathematical uh, considerations here where we think about sample size and making comparisons. And what we're asking you to do is think carefully about how you're going to make those considerations and what information you're masking or hiding when we are just using these aggregate categories. Well, let's take a, a, an extra look at one particular group here, this uh, category for other. Uh, we always see in these uh, surveys uh, the category for other. We have all these options that people are clearly represented, and then there's this option for other. And so uh, let's take a look at the definition of other in the dictionary. Um, what strikes me here uh, in this definition is the final entry uh, in, the, in the dictionary, disturbingly or threateningly different. Somehow this other group is disturbing, somehow it's a threat. And so there is a connotation around the word other uh, around, around, that particular, uh, around that particular group. Now, are there alternatives to that? We believe there are. Are there better ways to refer to, to people who are not specifically uh, listed in, uh, in the survey so that we are not literally othering them, right? I mean, describing people as the other not only has that connotation, it is literally othering people. So are there some alternatives? A few people we spoke to suggested the word another. Um, of course, as you can see here in this in the in the in the screenshot here of the of the thesaurus from Miriam Webster, you know, the word another grammatically doesn't quite match up. I mean, you might or not, that might or might not bother you. Um, but we think there are some some other options as well. Um, so another or another race or races, additional groups, all other self descriptions, people identifying as other or multiple races, identity not listed, and identity not listed in the survey. And I'm sure there are others. And if you have ideas, we'd, we'd love to hear them. Um, so these are all possible alternatives to using this word other. And for me, as someone who's trained as a, as a quantitative person, I get a little nervous if I grab my data from that survey and I go in, I'm going to change the word other to say additional groups. That's a, the term that I've decided for this particular project I'm going to use. I might be a little worried about changing the word other, but we think there's still a solution to that. And that is to just be upfront and just be uh, transparent about the fact the survey that you're using use the word other, you think it's not an inclusive, it's not an equitable word, it's not a word that you prefer to use. And so you're going to use it for purposes of, of this dashboard, of this report, of this blog post, of this visualization, you're going to use the word or the phrase additional groups. And you can note that in the text, you can note that in the sub, in a, in a footnote or an endnote to the table, the graph or the report. Regardless of whether you like any of those alternatives I just listed, I think we can all agree that when CNN uses the phrase something else, to describe people, that is certainly not something that we want to use in the way, uh, in the way of, of describing uh, uh, people or communities uh, or individuals. 
The last thing I'll, I'll, I'll mention here is on using colors with a racial equity awareness. Color is such an important part of the data visualization toolkit. And we think about being uh, equitable and having that racial awareness, we want to be careful with the colors that we, that we use. And again, I'm going to show an example here so you can get a sense of, of how this comes in. Uh, don't worry, I'm going to zoom into the legend here in a second so you can see the specific groups. Um, this is, again, another Tableau dashboard. Uh, this one, um, from uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. The left line chart here is showing changes in uh, the student body. Uh, each line represents a, a different racial or ethnic group. And, and, the, and the stack bar chart on the right shows the breakdown of those racial groups uh, across the different colleges or, or universities. I'm not smart enough to go to MIT, so I don't exactly know what they use. But okay, so that's what you're seeing here. You, there's lots of selections and drop downs and tabs along the top. Let me show you the, the legend here in the bottom. So what we have in this legend is we have nine different groups, Black or African-American students in the top left uh, of the legend in the dark red. Down the, down the column there, we see Asian groups in the, in the lighter red. In the right column, we have uh, students who identify as two or more races in that lightest red, pinkish color. Uh, students who identify as white in the blue, and then the international students and, and the uh, students who, were, who didn't identify their race in the gray colors. Okay, so we have at least two problems with this, um, with this, with this color, the colors that are used here. First is that notice that all the students of color are essentially lumped together in the shades of red, right? All students of color are in the red, in that red color palette, whereas white students are in the blue color. So the white students stand out as being somehow different, somehow being the norm, somehow being the group to which all other groups should be compared with. Why is that decision made? I mean, I think that's a norm that we need to uh, get over and think about. Why, if we're trying to make that comparison, why are we not making a Hispanic or Latino students the blue color or Asian students the blue color? Why are we forcing this comparison between white students and students of color? The second problem is even more problematic, at least the way that we see it. Let's go back to our choropleth map. Uh, from earlier. You can see here again that the uh, unemployment rate goes from the lowest state, states with the lowest unemployment rate in the light blue color and the states with the darkest, uh, sorry, states with the highest unemployment rate in the dark blue color. Well, that's a sequential color palette and we see the same color palette, same uh, model being used here where the implicit uh, suggestion here by using this color palette is that black or African-American students are somehow more or greater than students who identify as two or more races. Now, I don't think that the, the, the visualization developer thought did this in a malicious way, probably just didn't know that this is how these color palettes are, are used and how they're employed in data visualization. Um, now, uh, about a month later, uh, they revised that particular color palette. They revised the dashboard. Um, this is the new dashboard. This came out in July of 2020, the previous one in June of 2020. Uh, same basic dashboard, uh, new color palette. Let me zoom in again so you can see it. Here we have Black or African-American students in green. We still have four or five groups of students of color in shades of blue. Now we have the white students in that, in that peachish color, international students in red, and the students who didn't identify their race in gray. It's better. Um, but we still have uh, we still have these groups that are being compared against one another. We still have these uh, four shades of blue. I'm not saying it's particularly easy to pick out nine separate colors. Um, I could do that quickly at Color Brewer, one of the more popular uh, color tools in the field. But even when I do that, you can see that I still get shades of green and orange and blue. So it's not like I get nine independent colors. But we still think there's a way to be more equitable in our work when we have these different groups, uh, not just by using different colors, by changing the entire way in which we present the data. And so I'm gonna pass it over to Alice so that she can wrap this all together in a particular specific project uh, that she created at Urban. All right, thank you, John. Yeah, so tracking COVID-19's effects by race and ethnicity was a project I worked on last summer where we at Urban tried to uh, consciously and deliberately apply a racial equity lens to the way we were visualizing this data. Now, the goal of this particular project was to measure the disparate effects the COVID-19 pandemic has had on the health, housing, and livelihoods of communities of color. 
In the final tool, uh, users can select different metrics such as the household, share of households experiencing things such as food insufficiency, income loss, difficulty paying rent or mortgage, and other such metrics at different levels of geography. Now, what we have here is our initial idea for how we wanted to visualize this data. What we see here is a multi-line line line chart. So each racial or ethnic group is represented with their own line. And the line shows how the metric for that particular group has changed over time. And even though this is a perfectly reasonable and valid uh, chart type uh, for this particular kind of data, um, given that the focus of this project was explicitly on racial and ethnic disparities, we really wanted to take a moment uh, to reflect on whether or not this was truly the best way to visualize this data. And the more that we thought about it, the more we were concerned that there could be some potential drawbacks to this approach. We were worried in particular that showing the data in this way might uh, inadvertently encourage comparisons of each group to the best performing group. And this could potentially have some two, uh, negative impacts. One of which is that it focuses attention on what low performing groups are quote unquote lacking, uh, rather than how members of all races and ethnicities have been negatively affected by the pandemic. And on a related note, it can also make it seem like the best performing group is the goal that the other groups should seek to achieve, rather than having readers consider the specific needs and challenges facing each group. So we kept on brainstorming and we kept on iterating on the design and eventually came up with this as our final uh, version. Now, a lot has changed here, so let me just walk you through some of these changes. First off, uh, rather than having lines, we are now using these sort of dots and blocks to visualize the data. The dots represent the point estimates for the metric for a given uh, time period and a specific racial or ethnic group. And the blocks surrounding the dots are our confidence intervals around that estimate. We use transparency to show whether or not the difference was statistically significant. So the more opaque dots and blocks mean that the statistical significance, uh, sig that there was a statistically significant difference. And the more transparent dots and blocks mean that there was not a statistically significant difference. We thought it was important to convey this uncertainty so that readers didn't walk away thinking that there was a meaningful disparity when there wasn't one or vice versa. Now, another big change that you've noticed is that rather than cramming all of our groups into one chart, we actually broke this out into a set of small multiples. So now each racial or ethnic group is uh, depicted on their own uh, individual chart. We felt that using this small multiples approach might better encourage users to consider the specific needs of each group individually and would not promote any particular group as the standard or implied standard that the other groups needed to match. Now, because we have six charts that we're working with, this gave us a lot more room and allowed us to add a consistent benchmark that could be used across all the groups. Here, the relevant uh, state or metro area average. Now, I should also note that because we have six different charts, uh, we felt that it was also important to order these in a way that was meaningful. So what we decided here was to order the ch uh, charts alphabetically by racial or ethnic group. Um, because this is a dynamic tool, we, uh, when, we didn't want the order of the charts to shift around every time the user updated their selection. We felt that having a fixed order uh, would provide for a better user experience. So these are sort of the issues that we encountered and how we thought through them and why we made the decisions that we did. And as I wrap up our talk today, I just wanted to again reiterate that a lot of these guidelines that John and I have presented on really do come back to this idea of empathy and remembering that data are a reflection of the lives of real people. They're not just a sterile abstraction. So with that in mind, I want to thank you all for listening to our talk.